Welcome to School of Bible Believers, Lesson 26K. In Lesson 26, we're talking about grace living. Romans 6.14 says, You are not under the law, but under grace. So how does that work? That's what we've been going over. This is our 11th lesson within Lesson 26. Today we're going to be talking about the role of works. We've talked about how churchianity is trying to get you to stack a chair, to feed the homeless, to serve in the church, and they have all these kinds of works, and we said about how all they're doing is they're trying to make a fair show in the flesh, and that Paul says in Galatians 5 that if I'm trying to obey the law, making a fair show in the flesh, then I have fallen from grace. I'm not doing grace living. So how does, but yet there are works involved, so how does that work? Well, you look over in Romans 11, the first point we need to understand when it comes to works is that they are diametrically opposed to grace when it comes to our works, us trying to do it on our own. Romans 11.6 says, And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise work is no more work. I mean, that right there tells you plainly that it's just like oil and water don't mix. Well, grace and works don't mix. Well, when it's talking about, gra when it's talking about works, really, it's talking about your works. You trying, like I mentioned with churchianity. They want you to be on the serve team. You to love you, the, the church. You to be giving tithes. You to be doing all these works. And the role of works in grace living is really Christ doing the work through you. In Ephesians 2... Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So again, grace and works, they're two different systems. But then verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So the first point to understand when it comes to grace living and the role of works is that your works have nothing to do with grace living. If you are trying to do your works, even if you're trying to do it in the name of Jesus, if you say, well, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to this church, and so they want me to set up the, the tables and the chairs for the luncheon that we're going to have, or they want me to pay the tithes, or they want me to go out and serve the community on our serve day on every Saturday. Just because it's a church or it's so-called in the name of Jesus doesn't really mean it's of God. Remember Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your flesh, your heart, will try to deceive you into thinking you're serving God when you're really not. In Colossians chapter 2, in Colossians chapter 2, it talks about people who are trying to do their own works to please God. In verse 20, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, that would be your own works, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. That's the key there, commandments and doctrines of men. Just because you say it's of God doesn't mean it's of God. If I am doing service in the church to look good to my family, to look good to the community, then those are fleshly considerations. And I'm doing the things the church tells me, I'm not doing what God tells me to do. These works in verse 23 says, have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. It's worshiping my own will that in my own flesh I think I can serve God. And humility and neglecting of the body. See, I'm humble about it. I'm supposedly giving all the glory to God. 
I am not doing what I want to do on a Saturday, like go to a sports game. I'm out there serving the church. But it says, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. It doesn't honor God because you're doing works with the attitude of, I'm going to look good to the community, look good to my family, look good to the people in the church. Uh, I'm going to ease my guilty conscience. It's all about what I am doing in my flesh, even though it's said to be in the name of God. So works, it really all depends on your attitude that you have when you come to a work to determine if it is of God or not. That's why you can't say that stacking a chair or setting up tables for lunch or tithing or being on the serve team or serving the community on Saturdays. You can't say whether that is of God or not. There are no works that you could say, this is of God if you do these works, or these are not if, if they're not. What it is, it all determines on whether you're walking in the Spirit or if you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh. The words that you use to describe those works doesn't mean a thing. If you say it, it's in God's name or in Jesus' name or you're doing it for the church as opposed to yourself, it doesn't matter. What matters is your attitude with the work. If you have learned the lesson of Romans 11.6 that work, if it's by works, then it's not by grace. And you learn from Ephesians 2.8 and 9 that you are saved by grace, not of works. And then you decide to walk in the good works that God does through you. Then you are walking in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And Christ is doing the works through you, and so then they are of God. So it all depends on the attitude behind it. Why are you doing the work? So you could have a group of people setting up tables and chairs for some big church event. And you could have some people in there who are doing it because they're to look good to their family or their parents made them do it or to because they are on some committee in the church and they have to do it. Those types of attitudes are works of the flesh. Those are your works. But if you are recognizing who you are in Christ and you're doing the same thing, setting up those tables and chairs because you realize that that will be a service to cause people to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Maybe in an indirect way, because it's just a lunch in at the church, but still, it's, it's working for the Lord, and it's not me in my flesh. Then all you're doing is walking in the good works that God hath before ordained for you, and so then, that is of God. Even though it's the same two people doing the exact same things, one has the attitude of, it eases my guilty conscience, it makes me look good to the community, that's why I'm doing it. That is not of God. It is of the flesh. But the other person has the attitude of, this will help get people to the church so that people will be saved. That person then is doing it of God. That person's walking in the spirit, setting up the tables and chairs. The other person's walking in the flesh, setting up the tables and chairs. So it all depends on attitude. You look over in 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, at the judgment seat of Christ. It says, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry, you are God's building. You see there, the work there is, it's not me easing a guilty conscience or looking good to other people, it is God has made me part of his building. I am his husbandry, and so I am laboring with God. Verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. You see, it's within grace. God's work is always within grace because it's God doing the work through you rather than you doing it in your own flesh. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see the foundation there? It's a Foundation really is about the attitude. Is it, is it I am dead and my life is hid with Christ and God, and I'm crucified with Christ and Christ is living in me? 
If that's the attitude, then I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. I'm living by the foundation of Jesus Christ. The attitude is, yet not I, but Christ. But if I'm doing the work in terms of, it makes me feel like I'm closer to God, that I'm working my way to heaven, it makes me look good to the people I know, it, looks, um, it helps me in the community and my business relationships, then that foundation is my flesh. And so it says there, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If I come along and build a foundation or build upon Jesus Christ and I say, I'm going to do the work, Christ died for me, the least I can do is live for Him, and I and my flesh try to please God with all the great ideas and the things that I want to do, then what I'm doing is I'm building, I'm building my own works, which is in the context called wood, hay, and stubble. And that's not going to survive the fire of the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12 says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. If it's gold, silver, precious stones, then what I'm building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ is I'm building sound doctrine and I'm making decisions using the mind of Christ, using the sound doctrine that I've learned from God's Word and say, I'm going to do this work because I present in my body a living sacrifice and I'm allowing Christ to live in me and as an ambassador for Christ by doing this work, either directly or indirectly, it is going to cause God's will to be done for people to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. If that's my attitude, then I am God's workmanship and I am walking in the good works of God's workmanship. So then I am doing the gold, silver, precious stones. If my attitude is, I don't want to do it, my parents are making me do it, or my spouse is making me do it, or I have to do it because I'm on the committee of the church, or I got to do it because I got drunk the other night and this will make me feel better, like I'm really a servant of God after all, then what you're doing is you're laying your own selfish desires upon the foundation of Christ, and that would be the wood, hay, and stubble, which is going to be destroyed by the fire of the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day, that's the judgment seat of Christ, shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That's why there is not a list in the Bible that says, oh, reading the Bible is a work of God, praying is a work of God, uh, going to church is a work of God. It doesn't give you a list of things. Rather, it's all about your attitude. If your attitude is, yet not I, but Christ, it's Christ living in me. It's, I am dead and my life is hid with Christ in God, and I make decisions based upon that. Then the sort of work that I'm doing, what it is, whether it's reading the Bible, praying, going to church, stacking chairs, or whatever it is, if the foundation is Christ, and my, my, I'm using the mind of Christ to make the decision to do that work, then the sort of work it is, is gold, silver, precious stones. That's why you don't see a list of things. It says, the fire tries it to see what the attitude is. If, you know, if it has to be tried by fire, it shows that it's really the inward, it's the attitude. Because if it's a list of things, then God could say, okay, well, praying, reading the Bible, going to church, those are gold, silver, precious stones. So you did those, okay, you get a reward. But going to the bar and getting drunk and sleeping with a prostitute, those are bad things, and so you lose your reward. But you see, it doesn't give you the list. Just like you don't know if something is that precious stone or not. I've got, I went to Fort Knox years ago. Well, I couldn't go to Fort Knox. They wouldn't let me in where all the gold is. But I bought a little fake bar of gold. And you look at it, it looks pretty real. But there's a little pinhole that they poke through there and you can see it's not a real bar of gold. It's just lead. Uh, it's made to look like gold. You have to look on the inside. You look on the outside, it looks like a genuine gold bar. But you look on the inside, you find out, oh, that's not really gold. It's lead. You have to look on the inside to see. And that's what the fire does. If it was just works on the outward saying, reading your Bible, praying, oh, well, if that is the work, and you know it's gold, silver, precious stones, you don't have to put, be putting it in the fire. But if you've got to look inside and say, well, it looks good on the outside like that gold bar, 
but is the attitude that that person used in doing that work, what was the attitude behind it? And putting it through the fire is going to determine what sort of work it is. The reason the fire, you look at, for example, when we spend, etern where we spend eternity, you're either going to spend eternity with God, or you're going to spend it in the lake of fire. Well, the book of Isaiah talks about the breath of God like a fire is kindled, that it comes through. The breath of God is like a kindled fire coming through. And the reason that people suffer in the lake of fire is because their works are of the flesh. And God is holy, and He can't be marred by unholiness of the flesh, because in your flesh dwells no good thing. And so the way that God continues to be holy for all eternity, and sin doesn't mar Him, is that that sin is constantly burned up through the fires of hell. It shows what that person is on the inward. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 66, the last couple of verses in the book of Isaiah, it says in verse 23, Isaiah 66, 23, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. There are billions of people in the world today who are going into hell. And in the inward, they are nothing more than a worm, and they are going to be an abhorring unto all flesh who look upon them. But right now, they look pretty good. The supermodels of Hollywood or the movies or wherever they are, people say, wow, that's a very attractive person. They look great. Well, that's because they're all dolled up on the outside. But on the inward, the inward is an unbelief toward God, not having faith in God, and so they are just selfish fleshly people, fulfilling the lust of their flesh, and in a spiritual context, they will be an abhorring unto all flesh. But right now, they look okay. Jesus said in Matthew 23 to the Pharisees and Sadducees, He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, You make the outside look wonderful, but inside you are full of dead men's bones and all excesses. They looked great to men. Men looked at them and said, Rabbi, Rabbi. And they, they put them on a pedestal as holy men. If you ask any common Jew in Jesus' day, who is the holiest uh, of the people, they point to the Pharisees. But yeah, Jesus pointed them to them and said, You're full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Spiritually speaking, they're just worms that never die, and they're going to be an abhorring unto all flesh. But you see, men don't see that until the fires of hell try them and show that they are worms. Like I said, those supermodels or those Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders of today, they look wonderful to people. They think they're great. They make them their celebrity idols and have nothing but good to say about them. But when fire tries them, then what it does is it sees the inward, just like that bar of lead that I have that looks like gold. If you put it in the fire, you're going to see all that gold coating gone because it's not real gold. It's going to be, it's going to fade away and you'll say, I thought that was a beautiful bar of gold, but it's not, it's worthless. It's not worth anything. It's not gold because the fire showed it. The fire shows the inward is my point. And so in 1 Corinthians 3, when every man's work is tried, it's going to be tried by fire. And what that does is it gets rid of all the fleshly things saying, I'm a good person because I go to church or because I read the Bible or I'm serving God because I'm on the serve team at church. That's all outward show. When that fire comes, it's going to try it and it's going to see what was the inward attitude. It has to be tried by fire to figure it out because it's all about the inward attitude. And so it says in verse 14, after every man's work is tried, it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 14, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So you got the foundation of Jesus Christ in verse 11, and you build on that 
foundation, you build Christ. You say, yet not I, but Christ. You say, I'm crucified with Christ. You say, I've presented my body a living sacrifice to God. And then the fire of the judgment is going to try that work, and it's going to find out that the attitude is gold, silver, precious stones. It's something that abides the fire. And so it says he will receive a reward. But verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Because his foundation is Jesus Christ, he still has eternal life. But because he built works of the flesh, rather than works of Jesus Christ on it, the works of the flesh are burned. Only what is in Christ survives. And so it's all about the attitude. If I use the mind of Christ, if I say, yet not I, but Christ, and whatever I'm doing, then that is a work of God. That is a grace work. If you want to use the term, we saw works and grace don't mix. Your works and God's grace don't mix. But God's grace and God's works through grace are a winning combination. Because then God is glorified as long as it is in Christ. That's the point. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to go over some verses that really tell you that, that kind of concept. Because I had to start with this sort of as an introduction for the first 15 minutes or so here so you'd understand. Because churchianity is all about a fair show in the flesh. They build temples with steeples, with the stained glass windows, the pastor comes, he's got his suit on, or, or nowadays with the mega church they wear, what, skinny jeans? and Whatever the image is to make their flesh look good on the outside, that's what they're projecting to get the people in. It's all about image. That's all they care about. And God is the exact opposite. He is concerned about the inward man. You are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Before you are saved, your spirit is dead in trespasses and sins. You're an awful, ugly-looking thing on the inside because your spirit is dead. But when you believe the gospel, then you are quickened together with Christ, made alive in Him. And Christ is a beautiful, beloved, glorified uh, person as a result of Him having faith in God. And when you allow Christ to live in you, then God says, He looks at your work and He says, It's not your work, it's my work through my Son. And this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so I am honored through the work that you have allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to do through you. He looks at that inward man. The Lord searches the heart. We saw in Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Desperately wicked, who can know it? Verse 10 says, I, the Lord, try the heart, search the reins. He looks on the inward Whereas man just is concerned about the flesh, looking at the outward. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. You see, if your attitude is what he has in verse 33, it's, I could eat something or drink something, it doesn't cause me to lose my salvation, it doesn't really harm me in any way, because my life is hid with Christ and God. And if I am not seeking mine own profit, I'm not seeking to make a good business deal by going to church, or to look good to my family, or to ease my guilty conscience. All I'm doing is saying, Lord, I recognize that you have died for my sins, and now you live in me, and it is a wonderful opportunity to be an ambassador for Christ. And so I present, I take all my fleshly desires, and I set them aside, and I concentrate on you and your word, and allowing Christ to live in me. If I'm doing that, I'm not seeking my own profit but I'm seeking the profit of many or those out there who would be saved or come into the knowledge of the truth. If that's what I'm doing, then whatever I'm doing, according to verse 31, is to the glory of God. I could, in this case, he's talking about meat sacrificed to idols. He's basically saying, some people think that if you eat meat sacrificed to idols, you have sinned. 
And Paul is saying, I could eat meat sacrificed to idols and be in sin doing it, or I could eat meat sacrificed to idols and not be in sin. It's based upon my attitude. Now, let me give you another scripture. It's not on your outline, but I think it's 1 Timothy chapter 4. Because the Jews had certain meat that was clean or certain animals that were unclean. And then in the dispensation of grace, we don't have that restriction. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, it says that some people who are fought, verse 1 talks about seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They speak lies and hypocrisy. Verse 3 says they forbid to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving in them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. So, in Leviticus 11, you've got the laws to the Jews of animals that are clean, animals unclean. He says, now we're in the dispensation of grace, you don't have that. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, before he went to the house of Cornelius, saw this sheet of meat descend from heaven three different times. And the commandment was given to him by the Lord, rise, Peter, and kill and eat. Peter says, well, I, from the day I was born, I haven't eaten unclean meat. God says, well, something different now. What God is called clean, call thou not unclean. He says, all meat is clean. Now, I realize he's talking about the Jew and Gentile at that point. But the point is, it says, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. But notice the last part of that verse. If, if it be received with thanksgiving for... It is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. You see, what he talked about in 1 Corinthians 10, we didn't read the whole chapter, but he says, let's say there are some meat sacrificed to idols, and there are people in the room who think that eating that meat is a sin. Now you know that every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. So it's not a sin to eat the meat. However, if I eat the meat in front of the other person who thinks it's not okay to eat the meat, and then I cause that other person to go against his conscience, then I have sinned in eating the meat, even though God says it's not a sin to eat the meat. And the reason it's like that is because it's all about attitude. You see there in 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, but there's a condition on that. Just because God says every piece of meat is okay to eat doesn't mean that you will not sin if you eat the meat. Because it says it's only good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. In other words, if I am eating the meat thanking God for it, as opposed to thinking, well, I'm going to eat the meat, and I'm going to show the other person that I'm right on the scripture, and the other person is wrong. I know better than that other person. Well, now I've got an attitude of being in the flesh, because I'm going to show the other person that I'm right on this. So I've got a fleshly attitude, so it's not received of thanksgiving, it's received of the flesh. And so then I sin. But if it's received of thanksgiving, it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The attitude. Prayer is an attitude. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Prayer is not getting on your knees, closing your eyes, and talking to God, although you could call prayer that. But it can't be that all the time because how are you going to pray without ceasing? Because you can't have your eyes closed all the time. You've got to have your eyes open most of the time. Prayer is me talking over doctrine with God. And so if I eat something based upon the Word of God and prayer, talking the Word of God over with God, then whatever I eat is okay because it's going to be based on life in Christ. It's not going to be based on some fleshly consideration. So again, it's all about attitude. If it's my flesh, it's a sin. doesn't matter what the activity is. But if it's the attitude of yet not I but Christ, then it's not a sin. Again, doesn't matter what the activity is. So in this case... People uh, command to abstain from meats. Whatever I do, as he said in 1 Corinthians 10.31, 
whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That's why he says later on, or it may have been earlier in that chapter in 1 Corinthians 10. Yeah, earlier in that chapter in verse 23, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. If I am doing whatever I do with the attitude of yet not I but Christ, then I will not sin in whatever I do. In Romans 14, 23, it says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin, which means whatsoever is a faith is not sin. That's why 1 Peter 2, 22 says that Christ did no sin. And you can read over in John 8 that Jesus says, I always did what my Father, I always said and did what my Father wanted me to say and do. That's how Jesus never sinned. It's not that he avoided X, Y, Z activities and did A, B, C activities because A, B, C was good and X, Y, Z was bad. It's not the activities, it's the attitude. Because Jesus always did and said what his Father told him to do and say. Then he always abided by faith in God. And since he always had faith in God, he never sinned because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So it's all about attitude. Colossians chapter 3. Look in Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, we'll just skim through the chapter. He tells you in verse 2 to set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Christ is our life. If I consider, reckon myself to be dead indeed unto sin, and alive unto Christ, whatever decision I make, and I have that attitude, I will never sin. But the moment that I consider my flesh, what I want to do, then I am sinning because it's not a faith. Based upon Christ being our life, and based upon me being dead and my life being hid with Christ, verse 5 tells me to mortify or put to death my members which are <coughs> upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So, not... It's basically, it's if I've got that attitude of yet not I but Christ, Christ living in me, presenting my body a living sacrifice, then I'm not going to do the, the sins of the flesh, the fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. Instead, I am going to, and what I'm in verse 8, I'm going to put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of my mouth. I'm not going to lie to somebody, verse 9. And then what I'm going to do then, verse 12, is I'm going to put on. So I put off or put to death the things of the flesh, verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then verse 10, I put on the new man. Verse 12, I put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. You see how this is all about attitude? It's not about, well, I do ABC activity, so I'm serving God. No, it's I if I put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, then I'm allowing Christ to live in me. And then verse 14, and above all these things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. That's why Paul says over 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. He says in verse 3, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Doesn't that sound like a real good thing? That I take all the... I'm. I'm this rich person, I'm not really a rich person, but let's say I'm this rich person and I take all my material possessions and I use them, I sell them or whatever I do to help feed the poor. 
That seems like just the most wonderful thing you could do. But he says, if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned. I mean, you can't do anything more with your body than to completely give it up. He says, if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Profiteth me nothing. That tells you the attitude is what's important with God. The world, your church, those commercials they get on TV where they show those starving dogs or the starving kids in Africa and they say, oh, give money to that. And we're going to quote 1 Corinthians 13.3. I could bestow all my goods to feed the poor, give my body to be burned. But if I'm doing it out of an attitude of this is really going to make me look good to the community, to others, to God, this is going to give me a special place uh, in heaven for me doing all these wonderful things, if that's my attitude, it profiteth me nothing. That will be a work. Giving all my goods to feed the poor is going to be a work that is burned at the judgment seat of Christ and no reward given if it is done without charity. Because charity, go back to Colossians 3.14, that's why he says in verse 12 that you need to put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, and mind, meekness, long-suffering. But above all these things, verse 14, Colossians 3.14, above all these things, Put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or completeness. Charity is what shows Christ living in you. Because 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see how love is involved with giving? It's giving up your own Desires for the benefit of others. Whoa! God bless you. Thank you. That's charity. That's God's love. And so it's not about me doing these activities, but it's about what really brings it all together. Has Christ living in me? The works, the role of works in grace is that the attitude of charity or allowing God's love to come through in whatever I do. The attitude is I'm going to set up those tables and chairs for that luncheon at the church because it will enable the church to better show God's love to the community. If that's my attitude, then that is a work that will survive the judgment seat of Christ. But my attitude is it's going to make me look good to the people in the church and maybe they'll give me a, a position of leadership in the church then that is a work that's burned because there's not God's love. There's not charity involved with that. Okay. So you put on, in verse 12, so in verse 5, you mortify or put to death these bad works. Verse 12, you put on the bowels of mercies, kindness, etc. And then verse 14, above all these things, you have to put on charity which is the bond of perfectness, because without charity, it profits you nothing. Because without charity, then it's the attitude is my flesh. It's not God living through me. Verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And then notice the last two verses. So I've put on charity, the peace of God rules in my heart. Well, the, re the way then that Christ lives in me, is verse 16. Let, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There's your grace. That's a work in grace. It's God's work. How are you going to share God's love or charity, because charity is God's love, how are you going to share charity with the world when you don't know what God's will is. God is a spirit. His word is spiritual. Jesus Christ is the word. The Holy Ghost teaches you the word. It's all about the word with God. God the Father came up with the word or the plan. 
Jesus Christ is the execution of the living word, execution of the word, of the living word, and the Holy Ghost is the teacher to teach you the things of God. God is all about His Word. So when the Word of God comes into you, then you understand you can apply that Word of God in the given situation. And by doing so, you're sharing God's love or charity. So that's why it says, first you put on in verse 12 the things of God, the mercies, the kindness, and all that. Then verse 14, and above all these things, you have to put on charity. You have to make your decisions based upon what God would want rather than your own fleshly desires. And the only way you're going to know what God would want is verse 16, is if you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And I love how that verse starts. It says, let the word of Christ. Let is something you don't really have to give an effort for, you just allow it to happen. Now, you do have to give an effort in the terms of what 2 Timothy 2.15 says, that you have to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So you do have to work in terms of reading the Bible and believing it. But you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to understand the things of God. In fact, that would hinder you because of 1 Corinthians 2, it tells you, the natural man discerneth not the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the things of God are spiritually discerned. And it's the Holy Ghost who teaches you this, those things, comparing spiritual with spiritual. And so because it's the Holy Ghost work in your life to get you to understand the sound doctrine of God's Word, that's why verse 16 says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That word let shows what you're doing is you're presenting your body a living sacrifice. You're refusing to look at the Bible through a fleshly context. But you're saying, I'm going to believe God and His Word, I'm going to have faith in it, and I'm just going to let the Holy Ghost teach it to me. And when He does that, then the Word of Christ is going to dwell in me richly in all wisdom. And then I have the opportunity to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then it all comes together in verse 17. Colossians 3, 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Doesn't that sound similar to what we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 31? Whatsoever therefore, whether, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. He gave them sound doctrine in 1 Corinthians 10 regarding meat sacrifice to idols. And he showed them that it's all about your attitude. Faith in God means you're not sinning. Not having faith in God means you, you are sinning. And so then, if you have faith in God, then whatever you do, eat or drink, or whatever you do, is all to the glory of God. And so same thing in Colossians 3. He says, starts off that chapter, says, set your affection on things above. Well, that's an attitude of God's love coming through me. It's not fleshly, lustful desires. Verse 3, I recognize I'm dead. My life is hid with Christ and God. Verse 4, I recognize Christ is my life. The first application then is verse 5, to mortify or put to death the things of the flesh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate, and affection. So I put to death the things of the flesh, now I'm going to get sound doctrine in me. And then verse 12, I'm going to put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, and my meekness. Then, above all things, verse 14, I'm going to put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. That's going to make me complete in Christ. It's the thing that's going to have Christ living in me in every situation. But then to know what God wants me to do in those situations, in verse 16, I let the word of Christ dwell in me richly in all wisdom. And then the result will be when I do all that, verse 17, whatever I do in word or deed, I do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So, as I wrote on your outline, whether or not a work is of God depends on your attitude and not the work itself. Another example of this, go over to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. He says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled 
and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. The people, when he says they profess they know God, he's talking about people who have come into the church and they're giving false doctrine. He says in verse 10, There are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. You see, religion was big business back then, as it is now. Back then, the Jewish religion was the big business, at least in that context there. And that's why he says there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Basically what the Jews did, like if you look at Mark 7, for example, hold Titus, but look at Mark 7. Here are the Pharisees and the Jews. My point is what they're doing. You see, when you read like verse Titus 1.15 where it says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. The fleshly mentality of what Titus 1.15 is, is that the people who go to church and say they love Jesus and they serve God, those people are the pure. But the people who are getting drunk every night and cheating on their spouses or uh, committing murder or hatred, or cursing like a sailor, sailor, sail, sailor, sailor. Those people are the defiled and unbelieving. Those are the bad guys. The church people are the good guys. Those evil sinners are bad guys. That's the typical mentality of Titus 1.15. But what I want you to see is that what Paul is contrasting in Titus is it between the evil women chasing drunken people in the bars versus the people who go to church. What he's contrasting is people in church, the people who are teaching false doctrine are the, pure, are the undefiled. The people who are teaching sound doctrine are the pure. In Mark chapter 7, you've got God gave his religion to Israel in Israel's program. He gave them the tenets to follow, the things to follow in order to have faith in God and serve Him and please God. The Pharisees come along and they're not the ones with the outward show of we're murderers, we're rapists, although they probably were those things, but they didn't show it. They had a, a beautiful outward appearance. Remember what I mentioned in Matthew 23, that on the outward they look beautiful, but inward they are full of dead men's bones. When they came to Jesus here in Mark 7, they said to him, verse 2, When they saw some of Jesus' disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. In other words, the Pharisees are teaching that you eat with unwashed hands and you are defiled. And Jesus says to them, why are you worried about that? Verse 15, he says, There is nothing from without a man or outside of a man that entering in him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. Well, what are you talking about, Jesus? He says, well, verse 18, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And Jesus tells those Pharisees, he says in verse 9, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. See, the problem with man is that we look on the flesh. And man looked at the Pharisees and the Jews and says, Wow, they're the most holy people we've got. 
Jesus, though, he understands that it's not the flesh that's important to God, it's the spirit. And Jesus looked at the spiritual condition of those Pharisees. So while men looked at the Pharisees and said, these are holy men of God, they are wonderful examples of servants of God, Jesus looked at them and says, full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. And he gave them a lesson application. And he says, the Pharisees are so concerned with their hands, they say they're holy because they wash their hands and eat the food. But I say unto you that it's what's within that defiles the man, not what's on the outside, not what's on his hands. That it's from within, out of the heart of men, that proceed these evil things. So when you're in Titus 1, and verse 15, and it says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. What he's saying is that he's looking on the heart of man and he's saying if you come to God with the attitude of believing what God says, if you are a saved individual, you've recognized your sin, you've trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, and then you get the sound doctrine built up in the inner man from Paul's epistles, and you make your decisions based upon that sound doctrine, then you are pure. And whatever decision you make, regardless of what the world says, because the world told the disciples, you're sinning, eating with unwashing hands. Jesus says, no, they're not sinning. You, Pharisees, are sinning. Because you are using a defiled heart to make your decision. You use a defiled heart to say, I'm going to wash my hands before I eat. The disciples used a pure heart to say, I'm going to eat without washing my hands. So unto the disciples, since they're the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, the Pharisees, nothing is pure. So the Pharisees sin in washing their hands before they eat because they do it out of a pride in making their flesh look good. Look at how godly I am because cleanliness is sex to godliness. I'm washing my hands. Whereas the disciples didn't consider the flesh. They just says they ate because Jesus says, here's some corn, let's eat. Says, okay, I'm having faith in what God wants me to do right now, so I'm doing it. And they didn't bother to wash their hands. So the disciples eat with unwashing hands, but because they have faith in God, it's pure. The Pharisees eat with clean hands, but because they are working from an attitude of pride and on their flesh, then in so doing, they sin. And that's what this verse is saying. So you see there in verse 10, when he says in Titus 1.10, that there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. He's warning them. He's not warning them of murderers, rapists, drunkards. He's not warning them about those people. He's warning them about vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, or today you'd say, especially they of churchianity, because they subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. They teach doctrine that is, uh, they've got verses, they use God's name, they sound good to man, but they're doing it for filthy lucre's sake, which means they're doing it in the flesh. So if they're doing it in the flesh, then what they're doing is bad. It's a sin. And so he makes the comment there in verse 15, Unto the pure, all things are pure. In other words, if I have my attitude of Christ living in me, then whatever I do is faith in God, and it's not a sin. But for someone who has the attitude of obeying my flesh, following the lust of my flesh, then whatever that person does, it's going to be a sin. So that's what it means when it says, Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. That's why it's not pure, because they're using a defiled conscience. Verse 16, they profess that they know God. That right there tells you they are the Joel Osteens or the Joyce Myers. They are the people who look like they are representing God in what they say. They're not the ones who are the, the so-called bad guys, the murderers, the drunkards, 
the rapists. That's not who they are. They're people who have a big smile on their face, who talk pleasant words. They come into you peaceably, and everything they say sounds good. And they profess they know God, but the same people who profess to know God, Paul says five verses earlier in Titus 1.11, that their mouths must be stopped because they subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. They package their wickedness into something that is pleasing to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 11, Satan, Paul says that Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light, and it is no marvel that his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. Satan looks good. He doesn't look like the old red wrinkly... Uh, guy with the pitchfork and the crooked tail. He looks like an angel of light, something wonderful. His ministers, those who s teach false doctrine, look wonderful. They're dressed up to please the people. They smile. They say all the right things, the right tone of voice. Everything they do pleases the flesh. And they profess to know God. But in works, Titus 1.16 says, they deny Him being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. Ephesians 2 says, For we are, Ephesians 2 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. But these people, because they are operating by filthy lucre's sake, verse 11 tells you, they are looking for fleshly motivations for what they do even though they profess to be of God. They'll say, oh, I'm the church of Jesus Christ. I'm the church of God. I, oh, I profess to know God. I've got these scriptures to back me up. It says under every good work they're reprobate because they're not walking in the works of God, because they're not yielding their bodies as living sacrifices and walking in the Spirit. Instead, they're walking to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so whatever you do in the flesh, even if you profess to do it in God's name, then you are to every good work reprobate or completely worthless. There is no good work that God can do through you when you do not present your body a living sacrifice, but when you operate by the lust of your flesh. It has to be unto the Lord that you do these things. Romans 14. Look in Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. It's the same type of, Romans 14 is uh, similar to what 1 Corinthians 10 says, the argument about the meat sacrificed to idols. It's covering pretty much the same thing. Um, it says in verse 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. This is Romans 14, now verse 8. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die... We die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Again, it's not about what you do, this specific task, in this case, eating meat sacrificed to idols or not. That's not the issue. The issue is, are you doing it unto the Lord? Look over and 1 Corinthians 6, and we'll come back to Romans 14. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 6, last two verses, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 19, he says, Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. It's interesting, he says, speaking five words with my, un with my understanding. They the number five is the number of grace in your Bible. And it's interesting that there are a lot of things in, in the Bible that you could say in five words. 
Um, and this is one of them back in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Ye are not your own. Five words right there. Ye are not your own. You have that attitude with whatever you do, and you will never sin. Galatians 2. Yet not I, but Christ. There's another five words. Yet not I, but Christ. Romans 5, 8. Christ died for our sins. There's another five words. All those are Christ were grace words to you. Five word phrases. Christ died for our sins. Then that's not me in my flesh. It's Christ living in me. Yet not I, but Christ. Christ living in me. Ye are not your own. You remember that, that, the, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you recognize that your whole being, body, soul, and spirit, belong to God because He bought you with the precious blood of Christ, then what you'll do then is you'll humble yourself and say, I am dead and my life is hid with Christ and God. I reckon myself to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto Christ. I'll mortify therefore the members of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, and I will put on the new man. I will put on bowels of mercy, kindness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, and above all things I will put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or completeness. I will do all those things together. And so going back to Romans 14, that's why he says, you've got here in Romans 14, verse 5, he says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. You see there? If I had the attitude of life in Christ, Christ living in me, yet not I but Christ, ye are not your own. Christ died for our sins. If that is my attitude, it's all about Christ, and I am dead and my life is hid with Christ in God, if that's my attitude, then Christ is living in me, I am not sinning. Maybe I don't fully understand the doctrine, and I regard a certain day above another. You know, Paul tells us, over in Colossians 2, that really before you had these Sabbath days and new moons and all these things, he said they were a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So we don't need to have any man judge us in meat or drink in respect of a holy day. Because every day should be a Sabbath for us. A Sabbath is a day of rest for the Lord living in you. And once you are bought with a price and your life is hid with Christ and God, then Christ should be living in you every single day. Every day should be a Sabbath. It's not a special day. So if I understand that, it doesn't really matter these rules and regulations, if I follow them or not, as long as my attitude is Christ living in me, then whatever I do is not going to be a sin. So that's why he says, there are some people who regard the day, well, they regard it unto the Lord. But he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. And then the conclusion, verses 7 through 9, Romans 14, 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Remember what we read in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 20. You are bought with a price. The precious blood of Christ bought you. You were Satan's lawful captive, bound for death and hell. And Jesus Christ took the keys of death and hell, and the moment you believed the gospel, he loosed you from the bondage of death and hell, and took you away from Satan and says, You belong to me for all eternity. And he sealed you with that Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, which is the earnest or the down payment of your inheritance unto the day of redemption. You are guaranteed to have eternal life with God because the Lord Jesus Christ bought you with his blood, 
loosen you from the chains of death and hell that Satan had you bound with. And so whatever you do, you are the Lord's. And that's why he says, verse 7, Romans 14, 7, None of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. In other words, the reason Christ died, rose, and revived, meaning he died, was buried, and rose again, the reason he did that was that he could be Lord of the dead and the living. So that means whatever you do, since he's bought you with his blood, you are Christ. So now you have the freedom to allow Christ to live in you. And that's why you go to 2 Corinthians 2. And 2 Corinthians 2... In verse 12, Paul says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. So, think of those just those two verses for a second. Here is Paul. He goes to Troas to preach Christ's gospel. And he's got a door open unto him of the Lord. Basically, he says, God has called me to preach the gospel. He's, he, says, uh, he says over in 1 Corinthians 9, in his first letter to the Corinthians, that we have recorded anyway, he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. That's another point to prove it's all about attitude. A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto Paul. Romans 11 says that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. In Acts 9.15, when God called, the Lord Jesus Christ called Paul, while he's on Damascus Road, that light shone upon Paul. He says, I have made you a minister unto the Gentiles, unto kings, and unto the children of Israel. He says, I have, he basically he has dis dispensed a gospel. Paul's gospel. He gave to Paul, and he says, you are to preach it throughout all the world. To everybody. Jews, Gentiles, kings, everybody. Preach this gospel. That's why he said in verse 16, Necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel, because he is specifically called to do that. The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven told him that. But you notice verse 17, he says, If I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Basically, what he's saying is, if I preach the gospel and I say, I don't want to do this, I hate going to the, all these people and preaching. I wish I could just fulfill the lust of my flesh and have a good old time. But the Lord has commanded me to do it. I have to do it. So I'm going to do it because I have to do it. Basically, he's saying he, he would not get rewarded for it. He's preaching a gospel that will save people. And if people believe that gospel, they are saved. They go from being in the pit of hell to be, having eternal life with God. So it's a wonderful thing. It's the best thing you can do is to preach the gospel so that people will be saved. But he says, if I don't do it willingly, I won't get a reward. He says, I have to do it willingly to have a reward because I have to have the attitude of yet not I but Christ. I have to have the attitude of I'm preaching the gospel so that people may experience God's love and be with God in heaven for all eternity instead of being in hell. That's why I'm doing it. If that's why he does it, he has a reward. But if he preaches that gospel, and he just does it because he's forced to, the Lord made me do it, I have to do it, then he's not going to get rewarded for it. I mean, that right there tells you that a, the role of works and grace has nothing to do with the work itself, but it has to do with the attitude with which you do the work. So anyway, here is Paul 
The dispensation of the, of the gospel is committed unto him. So here he is going back to 2 Corinthians 2.12. 2 Corinthians 2.12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, because dispensation of the gospel is committed unto him, so he's going to Troas, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. So the Lord commanded Paul to do it. Paul does it willingly. The door is opened of the Lord for him to do it. Perfect scenario, you think, right? So he's going to preach the gospel. But he says, <laughs> verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. You read that and you think, weren't you outside of the will of God, Paul? God called you, Paul, to preach the gospel. Dispensation of the gospel is committed unto you. You go into Troas to preach the gospel. The Lord opens a door for you to preach the gospel. And now you leave. Doesn't that mean you went against God's will? Well, he says he did it because he didn't find Titus. So he's worried something happened to Titus. So, sure, God wanted him to preach the gospel in Troas. And people, maybe they would have been saved from that. The Lord opened the, the door for him to do so. But it's also not bad that he says, well, I'm going to forego preaching the gospel in Troas right now because now I've got to find out about Titus, my brother. You know, Titus is important. We read Titus 1 before. Titus was in, um, in Crete, and there were a lot of uh, those unruly and vain talkers of the circumcision who were doing things to subvert whole houses for filthy lucre's sake. We read over there in Titus 1, 10 and 11. Titus was appointed by Paul to take control of that situation to keep those vain talkers, especially they of the circumcision, from infiltrating the body of Christ and from stopping Christ living in those people. So, the fact that he found not Titus' brother doesn't mean it was bad that he took his leave of the people in Troas and went to Macedonia to find Titus. What I'm saying is, it's all about the attitude. Preaching Christ's gospel is a wonderful thing, but finding Titus and finding out what happened to him is also a wonderful thing. And you don't have Paul fretting over this with a guilty conscience, saying, oh, I should have preached the gospel when I had the chance. But notice what he says in verse 14, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. But thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? Why is Paul always a sweet savor of Christ? Why does Paul always triumph in Christ, thanks to God? And why is the savor of his knowledge manifest in every place by, by Paul? Because, verse 17 gives an answer, for, therefore, because we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. God always causes you to triumph in Christ regardless of what the world does and regardless of your decision. Whether you say, I'm going to forgo preaching the gospel in Troas and I'm going to Macedonia to find out about Titus. He always causes you to triumph if, if, verse 17 is true. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God but of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. If whatever decision you make, even if it's to forego preaching the gospel, whatever decision you make, as long as your decision is, yet not I but Christ, I am crucified with Christ, I live by the faith of the Son of God, as long as your decision is made out of walking in the Spirit as opposed to a fleshly attitude decision, then... God always causes you to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by you in every place. 
even when your decision seems to be diametrically opposed to what God is doing. Because he says God caused him to triumph in Christ even though he went to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to him of the Lord to preach the gospel, and he didn't do it. He left and went to Macedonia, not for fleshly considerations, but because he found out Titus' his brother. And he thought, yes, I've been commissioned. A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Yes, I'm apostle to the Gentiles. But I've got Titus under me, and he is my worker, and he's going to, he probably wasn't there yet, but he would eventually go over to Crete. And God says over there, in, I want to say it's 1 Timothy 2. No, I want to say it's 2 Timothy 2. He says in 2 Timothy 2, 2, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who should be able to teach others also. That's what Paul did with Titus. So, Paul, my point is, Paul did not make a fleshly consideration in saying, I am not preaching the gospel in Troas right now. But he was looking at it from the standpoint of Christ and saying, Christ told me, yes, I'm apostle of the Gentiles. Yes, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. But I'm also to commit the sound doctrine to faithful men who can teach others also. And here's Titus. And I didn't find him. I got to find out what's happened in him. Maybe I can help him out. It was a, my point is, foregoing preaching the gospel in Troas at that point was not a fleshly decision. It was based upon walking in the Spirit, thinking about Titus and the ministry that Titus would have in doing God's will. And so because of that, even though he foregoes the gospel, he says, I don't have a guilty conscience about that. Because God always causes me to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by me in every place. Why? Because I am not as many which corrupt the word of God, but of, as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Because I am making this decision based upon the sound doctrine and about using the mind of Christ and Christ living in me, then whatever decision that is, Christ is, um, uh, God is going to cause me to triumph in Christ. It's by faith, it is not a sin, and it's doing works, but walking in the works that God has before ordained, and not my own fleshly works. So that is the role of works for grace living. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us the Holy Ghost to teach us the things of God, to give us the mind of Christ, and specifically, more importantly, for saving us by the precious blood of Christ, giving us eternal life in heavenly places, and allowing us to mine the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hid in Christ. I pray that we will always consider your word and Christ living in us above our flesh and the things of this world so that you will triumph in us in every case. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thanks for joining us, and next time we probably will conclude this uh, Grace Living lesson by talking about God's works versus man's works, so join us then.